and then this week. So distinctive cholexeme analysis. So remember that cholexemes, um, there are a bunch of different phrases for this, kind of going off my email someone sent me today. Um, constructions are any kind of combinations of words, so like engrams. Um, sometimes you'll see the phrase colostructions. Sometimes you'll see the phrase colicates. They're all kind of the same idea of these phrases that we're interested in, in measuring and examining uh, for their grammatical slots. So generally we have some sort of first word that we're interested in and what comes next. So for our cellar door example from last week, um, we're sort of interested in like, if I have cellar, like what is the probability of that combination cellar door versus sort of everything else? So everything other version of cellar or every other version of door. Um, generally the lexeme is the first word and the colexeme or the co conspirator or the one that co-occurs is the second word or phrase because it can be more than one word. So we're going to expand upon that idea tonight and do a specific analysis called distinctive colexeme analysis. That's sort of last week's extension. All right. So tonight I'm going to talk about grammar versus the lexicon, uh, constructions and colexemes. And I'll give you some examples of how those work and um, work through the DCA analysis. Okay. I'm going to hit the air button though because all that rain and now it's muggy up here. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So when we're talking about the lexicon, we're usually thinking about our mental dictionaries. So the lexicon is sort of like a, oh, like a Merriam-Webster that you can open and pull up a word. It's got the head word or lemma, which is the mo like the root form of a word. It's got its definition, all of the forms of the word, and um, its uses, etc. Um, I don't know what raising hands does. <laughs> I've never seen that before. Uh, I'm not, I'm like mildly okay at connect. You think I'd be better at it by now. Anyways, so uh, like I said, if you have something, just type in the box. Yeah. Um, so our lexicon is our dictionary. Okay. It's our understanding of word meaning. It's phonetics, or it's sounds, right? And orthographic, or the way it looks. Because there's this idea that when we're processing uh, language, speech, or reading, uh, there's a race between two sides where we're processing by the way that it looks or the sound of spelling rules, the way that it could be spoken. And then grammar was viewed as a sort of separate set of things where we have these rules about syntax and how to create meaningful sentences with these rules, but nothing about the meaning or the semanticity or the, the definitions of words. And so sometimes this is called a construction-based approach, um, sometimes called pattern grammar or lexical chunks. And when we uh, decide that these are not separate things, we're going to combine them. <coughs> we're integrating the lexicon and the grammar, um, applying that us people as statistical language processors, right, we're all intuitive statisticians from the first lecture, uh, there's really no difference between the lexicon and grammar. Okay. Now, definition-wise there is. The lexicon is the dictionary, the grammar is the rules, but when it comes to processing and, and, and using languages, um, these two things are not completely separate bins. Like our brain doesn't, it's like, only dictionary here and only rules here. Instead, the idea is that there is an interaction between those two things. And so this is called colostructional methods, um, where we are investigating that interaction of words and their constructions, 
or essentially the interaction between um, the semanticity, the words themselves, and their grammatical slots, okay, which is the syntax of the sentence. And so we're trying to understand the structure of grammar and syntax, or sorry, uh, lexicon and grammar together. Because they clearly interact. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having these conversations about um, how part of speech is the driver of what can come next in a sentence. Right? So certain types of verbs, intransitive or transitive verbs, that determine the next phrase that's possible. So constructions are this idea behind the construction-based approach that we construct language based on the, di the dictionary and the syntax allowed uh, and what that means is that grammar consists of four meaning pairs right which is this idea that there are are rules where each word can go based on its semantics uh, which basically makes it not that different from understanding the dictionary because in the dictionary it tells me it's a transitive verb and that immediately tells me where it can go in a sentence and what is required around it. Okay. And verbs are often considered the drivers of a sentence because they impose the most rules. Okay. So some verbs have different, um, like subject verb agreement forms, like I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks, with an S. Um, some verbs have rules what can and can't come next, so direct objects. So often this is analysis is centered around verbs because of their dominance in a sentence. But we could apply this to tenses, we could apply it to phrases, we could apply it to words. We're going to focus on words because it's easiest, but this isn't necessarily just a analysis only for words. All right. And what the advantage of this. What is the purpose of this versus last week, right? What it does is it allows me to apply like hypothesis testing um, and converting things that are qualitative words into numbers and now that means I can apply statistical tests. Okay. I think you guys as a group, I don't have to really spend a lot of time convincing you that we can do math on words, um, but I would say in general I spend a lot of time <laughs> when I tell people what I do um, like, oh, I do corpus linguistics, and I'm a statistician. Like, how do those two things go together? I'm like, I do the math of words. And they're like, words don't have math. And I'm like, oh, honey, you are missing out. <laughs> words have lots of math. Frequency is everything. Um, but the advantage is that this really allows me to um, sort of have that same statistical rigor that we might see in, like, a t-test. Uh, and this is basically the Association Measures Chapter Part 2. And I'm really going to try to highlight the differences uh, between calculating just like conditional probabilities and doing this sort of analysis. Click, click, there we go. It's also a little bit more objective. So one of the larger criticisms of linguistics in a whole, as a whole is that it can tend to um, lean towards the subjective because humans are doing the research and humans are biased and that's just something we can't get around but at least with numbers um, maybe it's a little bit more objective than just kind of collecting um, examples to prove your point which would be um, confirmation bias right so only reading the things you want to read which is sort of the headlines of the news today but um, using this case numbers. Now, uh, I think as analytics people and data science people, we all know that you can make numbers say whatever you want. You can torture them into talking. Um, but this gives us a structure to follow that allows us to be a little bit more objective. So we might think about the phrase into the night, right? Um, it got late into the night. Um, what does that actually mean? And can we show that it has different meanings based on different uh, constructions? I mean, for me, this the, the, the way that I use this is this 
particular slide. So what restrictions do grammar, does grammar impose on what can come next? And I like to talk about grammatical slots because it makes sense to me that a sentence is an open set of, of spots, right? There needs to be a noun phrase. Right? Well, I can stick in a noun phrase, I can stick a determinant, an adjective, and a noun. Okay? Then there needs to be a verb phrase. In a verb phrase, it could stick a verb. Then I could go with another noun phrase, a preposition phrase, more noun phrases, more verbs. I could go nuts. I could add new sentences. And what distinctive colleague analysis allows me to do is to examine those noun phrases for phrases, patterns, as pairs, or more, um, to see if there's what pa what the pattern is. So, are there differences in British and American English, for the example today, in the usage of those grammatical slots? Um, are there differences in um, if you were to look at <clears throat> Excuse me. If you were to look at um, pre and post presidency for Trump, which is the the homework assignment, are there differences or changes in linguistic uh, usage pre and post? So you can actually look at linguistic shift, is what it's called, when people move from one style to another. So this allows us to to quantify those differences when people say, "Oh, they write different." Well, what do you mean by that? Well. Now I have an analysis for that I could apply. Um, and so I copied this quote, I think, either from the book or from the article. I can't quite remember. And I have no idea where anything is right now still. I'm slowly unpacking books and finding books that I was like, oh, I love this book. I forgot I had it. Um, my husband's like, I can't believe you feel this way about books on math. And I'm like, what this book? I love it. Anyway, and the book for this class is one I haven't found yet, but this idea that words occur in constructions, remember construction is just a phrase, a pair of words, um, so a word happens in a construction if it's compatible, right, it makes sense in that construction, and it is allowed grammatically. So the meaning assigned, uh, assigned by that slot, that grammatical slot, right, and it coincides in meaning. So that means we've got the lexicon for meaning and the slot rules for grammar, and um, that would be a construction that would have a stronger attraction ratio. So a couple of types of these analyses, um, just regular old colexeme analysis is what we did last week. It's a measure of attraction or repulsion. Sometimes repulsions are called reliance. Um, it, it looks to me like people use it more as repulsion, but if they don't repulse each other, they rely. So um, that's what we did last week. Distinctive colexeme analysis adds another layer. So it's a measure of preference of one um, pair over another pair with a categorical variable to split. So with colexeme analysis, I was looking at he can and she can, and then I was also looking at just cellar door. With DCA, I'm going to have some sort of categorical variable involved as well. So I'm going to I'm going to do American English versus British English. But what you need that's really different from last week is that you need some sort of um, t-test variable, basically, where you're going to split the data into pre-presidency and post-presidency for Trump, or, um, like I said, American and British English, or the example from the book is different first words. It's go and then uh, go and. So you've got some sort of grouping variable is what I'm trying to say. Then you run a bunch of colexeme analyses right, and calculate um, attraction. And you can see which ones are the most attracted based on your categorical split. So we need data, lots and lots of data for this type of analysis. And multiple DCA is really kind of what we're doing. Uh, but it expands to, to multiple groups. 
So like uh, you might do American English versus British English versus uh, what they speak in Australia, which I guess is Australian English. I don't know. They have a, it's a different variant of British. Additionally, we can do covariant colexeme analysis. And this one's a little different in that you're looking at one particular word, like maybe the word have, and you're seeing how many times it appears in each slot. So if I have two words, it could be the first word or the second word. So you're varying one particular word and where it goes in the construction versus looking at a lot of constructions where the second word is different. So generally with DCA, you have one word at the front, okay, maybe two, and you're varying the second word, right, the colex name. For covariant colex name analysis, you're, you're actually varying if it goes first or second. So we're kind of treating these as, if you think about these as t-tests, a DCA analysis is a between subjects t-test for two different groups. A covariant colex name analysis is a dependent t-test where the groups are the same, we're just switching which order they go in. So let's work one of these. It's not a hard analysis, especially after last week's discussion. Um, you just have to kind of think about how to deal with many associations. So what we're going to do is have a ton of co-occurrences. And we're going to see which co-occurrence has the strongest preference or the strongest attraction for these construction combinations. There's a lot of co-words in this lecture, all right? So if you just see construction, co-instruction, co-location, co, co, co remember that these are just words that occur together, or phrases um, that we can see. Uh, oh, and so last night, like I was, uh, I was teaching the 520 the sentiment class, and we were talking about predictive text analyses. So, um, you know, if you've ever done the thing, it was a meme for a while where our, uh, you would start typing on your phone and you would tell it to pick the middle of the suggested text every single time um, and see what sentence phrase you came up with. That is kind of essentially a mini version of this where it's one word to the next, so they're bigram frequencies, so it's predicting the most second most frequent word you use with whatever you're currently typing. Um, and this kind of analysis can be used to show which ones of those pairs are the most um, attracted. So essentially, when it gives you the option, so let me, let me just try one. I'm going to text my husband something random. So if I type, hey, what? Um, the next word that comes up with what is up, right? Because that's the most frequent um, uh, combination, right? If I say what's up, then the next word that comes up with the, the and did, uh, okay, let's go did. The next one is you, the, and I. Right? And so essentially that's what DCA does, is it helps you figure out which one is the most attractive. Yeah, so that's what they were talking about last night, was um, uh, G Suite. So the person who was mentioning this um, said that their company uses G Suite, which is like Google's business version. And essentially when they're writing emails, it like suggests entire phrases um, of what they should be typing. And so we we're talking about the the... the the only way you can do that sort of thing is when you have an extremely large data set on knowing what to predict entire phrases like that. And I would say that Google is one of the people that has such a data set. Um, and so that's the trade-off, I suppose, what, with, the, with technology, right? We, we give them our data so that they can give us these tools, but then they have it. Um. So an example. Uh, Wolf, looking at the British National Corpus, and um, two options here, go and v. So uh, this is a verb combination where you would say something like, I'm going to go and check the drinks. So we're interested in the verb there. 
versus go v. So without the word and there, go find the books and show me. So you go through the British B and C and you find all the combinations where go and and you count the number of, of V options and then all of the ones that are go verb. And we're trying to, that's our, our between subjects test here, right? So word combinations are either go and verb or they are go verb. And we're going to see what words are most attracted to being go and verb and what words are most attracted to be go verb. Um, what they found was that the verbs that are used in each of those slots are not a subset of each other. If the verbs were perfectly equal, the attraction measures were all the same, then we could say that the and is basically useless. If these things are perfectly synonymous, they're used um, in exactly the same way. But since they're not a perfect subset of each other, these things are not synonymous, and that means there's something different semantically about having go and versus just go. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, so go and verb. So here are a collection of verbs that went with go and. Right? Vandalize, stay, knock, eat, spoil, tidy, right? Collect, go and collect. Um, our options for attraction for go verb, zoom, figure, walk, unbind, some of these are weird, um, evaporate, search, rack, hammer. And then here's the ones that are synonymous. Go and get, go and see, go get, go see, go fetch. And so what we see is that a lot of these particular verbs are um, commands, right? They're, they're, they're things that they're, you're telling the person to do, go get, go see, go and get, where uh, these two are not so much. So when you have the overlap, it's mainly to tell someone to do something. Um, when you don't have the overlap, what you're looking at is you have to try to figure out what is the difference here. So here's the interpretive dance part. Um, trying to understand what semantically is the difference between the non-overlapping sections. Okay. Then they took and they did the same analysis um, with American English versus British English. And this is a really popular thing to do just because the data sets are available. So there are very large corpora for both of these languages, both of these variants of English, so they're not separate languages. Okay. And looked at um, the flavor of languages, right? So looking at the word into, uh, which is a preposition. So he blackmailed me into doing it. And looked at it as a negative. Looked at into as a persuasive. She talked me into doing it. And the example we're going to do is looking at the word quite um, and uh, the adjectives that come after quite. I'm trying to remember what happened in the study. I think uh, I think British British English was more of the negative and American English was more of the persuasive. Is that our article? Or did I give you the grise? No, I can't remember. Stuff, uh, that's the one about, well, this is the 2006 article, so this is the one with go v. If I remember correctly, I'll give it to totally be getting this back, but I'm pretty sure that it, it runs contrary to belief. Most people believe that Americans are very brash, or sort of forceful, <laughs> um, and so I remember being surprised that, that we, we were more of the that there were more persuasive arguments in American English and more negative, forceful ones in British English, but I could have it backwards. Okay. Either way, this particular example, um, what we're going to do is focus on the word quite. Okay. Um, so it could be something like this restaurant is quite good. 
These, res these results are quite extraordinary. Um, and so basically this analysis is going to help us understand the usage of the word quite and how that might be different across um, cultural boundaries because obviously American and British English are pretty much the same language. We have the same repertoire of words and so most of our differences are more cultural than they are uh, Creole or Pigeon style. Um, and so if we look at British English and we think about the way that quite tends to operate. It can be a maximizer. Um, so this is um, paired with like a limiting variable. I'm quite sure, or this is quite clear. Okay, now I am obviously American, so when I say these things, I think about how I would use them, but if I told someone that I was quite clear, I'm usually being kind of mean, <laughs> right? Where it's like, come on, this, this the it's in the syllabus kind of joke, right? This is quite clear. I don't get what you're not getting. It's kind of this like side eye kind of thing, right? Um, or it can be paired with an extreme adjective. It's quite huge. It's quite astounding. And what you're doing with a maximizer is you're increasing the adjective. Okay? Um, so you are maximizing the adjective is where it comes from. Okay. You could also moderate the adjective. <clears throat> where you might pair it with, with what's called a scalar adjective, um, good, nice, interesting. And this is sort of saying like, oh, it's quite good. It's kind of like, eh, it's okay. okay. And so it's kind of like using it as a fairly. It's fairly nice. You know, it's not freaking great. Right? It's, eh, it's okay. So we can either maximize or we can moder moderate. In American English, um, mostly it's a maximizer okay, used in the same way as very or extremely. Right? So it's quite good, like you're really excited. Right? Versus in British English, it's more like, oh, it's quite good. Like, eh, it's okay. Um, now, a lot of this also has to do with tone of voice um, or uh, body language, but you can't get that out of the BNC. It doesn't tell me these things. so. Uh, these are interpreted based on um, other markers in the sentence as well. And really but not used as much with extreme adjectives, okay, like quite astounding. And instead, it's, it's more likely that Americans are using the word really. We love the word really. Okay. It's used a lot um, in American English. It's a weird word, too, because it can go in almost any place in a sentence. So, hypothesis, given this um, historical understanding of the difference in the way that people use uh, the word quite, um, American quite constructions are less extreme in their adjective use than British English, and there might be more limit adjectives with quite in American English. Uh, because limiting adjectives are kind of around before we did the split. Okay. Uh, so limiting adjectives are more of our kind of moderator adjectives. Oh, I'm sorry, limiting adjectives here. Quite, quite sure, quite clear, less extreme adjectives. All right, so let's see what happens. The uh, analysis is on the corpus of global web-based English. Um, that is actually available on the same website as COCA. Uh, but this is pulled into Arling. So uh, we're going to look at the data that's quite American, quite British. It's actually also quite Canadian in there if you're interested in examining the differences between us and um, our northern neighbors. And it's uh, in the global web-based English, there's geographic differences of English in 20 different countries. Um, I was about to say, which also allowed us to make maps, but then that was my other class. So we're going to get use that to make maps later <laughs> this semester. So if I look at how this data set looks, 
um, all it is is the it's the the adjective that comes after quite from the American English and the literal number of times it occurred. So it's just a set of frequencies. We're quite different, quite sure, and quite clear are at the top. Okay. So these are limiting adjectives. Quite good is a moderator adjective. Okay. Quite simple, also a limiting adjective. Okay. So those are our top most frequencies. If I look at the British English one, quite different actually appears at the top as well. Also quite sure. So the top two are the same. Happy is up here. Good and clear are also up here. So, so far, it's looking like they actually overlap quite a bit, but, the big but here. Um, there are, are uh, I was going to say quite a lot, <laughs> there are a few differences in the corpus size. So if we look at the number of constructions uh, or collectines for quite in British um, English, there are more of them. They're just used paired with more words. So this, when you think about what we did last week, we did one pair at a time, right? Cellar door, or two pairs, he can, she can. We're now up to the point where we're talking about 3,700 different combinations of quite and an adjective. So this is collexeme analysis or uh, traction on uh, a much larger scale. There are 3,000 combinations for American English. And so we already seen some basic level differences here, so we can't compare the data frames just by looking at the top 10 of each word, because that um, doesn't tell us the whole picture. And then here's the other problem um, inherent in, in these kinds of analyses, is that the, the sum of the usages are going to be very different too, maybe. Okay. So not only are British people using more combinations, they're doing it twice as much as Americans. Okay. So we got to deal with those um, underlying differences in frequency first. <clears throat> and so, ta-da, we're going to look at this chart again, but slightly rearranged where we have the construction for American English, okay, so quite. Okay, the construction for uh, British English, still quite. The colexeme, or the co-occurring word with it, this is going to be every other one of those combinations. So we have this little square for every one of those rows. Okay, so we have 3,700 plus of them. Um, so this would be good then different, then sure, then happy, a lot. Okay. And then to finish out our square, it's basically all the other colexemes. So um, not every other word in the corpus now, but all the other possible combinations of that colexeme. So this would be quite good for Americans. This would be quite good for British people. This would be every other frequency, every other quite combination minus good. Uh, for Americans, and then every other not quite good uh, for British folks. So it's the same basic flavor as our attraction statistics from last week, uh, but the setup of the chart is slightly different, where this is a between subjects variable, essentially, right? It cannot be in both columns. And this here is only the colexemes that are possible, one at a time versus everything else. So, since we're not entering this data ourselves, we're going to take these two data sets and merge them together. I'm going to use the merge function. Uh, if you like inner and outer join, go nuts, but uh, base R is good for me. So I'm going to merge quite British, quite American. Okay. Merge them by the adjective column so that we can um, combine the ones that are the same. But definitely want to return all of them, so do all equals true. Because okay. it's not like I want to drop this one quite abashed. Okay. Uh, it's very much a British thing to say. Uh, so the American one is NA because there's no 
that is not doesn't exist in the data frame. Quite abominable. So this would be a maximizer. Quite abrasive, also a maximizer. Um, so I've merged them together, and here's what that looks like. Now I got to deal with these sneaky NAs because those are not missing data; they're just zero. So I swear to run this analysis, it takes longer to set it up than it does to actually run it, um, which is true of a lot of things. I think right, data screening takes forever. So I want to convert all of those NAs to zeros. Okay, so I'm going to say the data set, which I've called quite. Um, that word's going to sound weird to me the rest of the night, but is NA, right? Is it NA? Any of the columns or rows, make it a zero. And that just allows me to actually compare them and not drop them. Because it could be that one word is used exclusively in one variant of a language and not in another, and that could be really interesting. What you tend to find, though, is that you get these little one versus zero kind of columns. But we don't want to drop them because they aren't missing. Okay, they're just not um, ever used. Now we're going to go nuts. Okay. So we're going to create A, B, C, D. Um, so A is going to be all of our British constructions in our example here. I don't know why I made A British and B American. I think maybe I was following along with the book chapter because it makes a lot more sense for A to be American and B to be British. But uh, it doesn't matter what order you put the A and B in. So let me back up to the table here. Construction A and construction B are interchangeable. Uh, the interpretation will change, okay, whichever way you flip them, but you could flip them either way. Now, when we get to the interpretation, I'll show you how it changes. Okay. So whichever one you make A, it becomes the, the reference group. Okay. So this is like a dummy coding and regression. This is our comparison point. So we're, we're comparing British to Americans um, where uh, at the end, I think all the positive ones become British and all the negative ones become American, but if you switch it, they just switch sides. So we're going to say, give us all of our combinations. So that makes A now a vector. It's all of the um, frequencies for, um, brain fart, all of the frequencies for British constructions. B becomes all the frequencies for American constructions. C here is everything except the original one. So check out what happens here uh, in C. So there are, we summarized this a minute ago. The sum of all of the quite constructions in British English is 61,722. Too much pizza. All right. So C now is the sum again, minus each one one at a time. So this is vector math, where we're just subtracting um, each one from the sum. So there's one here. So that makes that 61,721. Okay. There were 91. So we've subtracted 91 from 61,722. For D here, that's the sum of, it's the same thing, but for Americans, right, the sum of Americans minus that um, B column. So really this is uh, the sum minus A, and this is the sum minus C, uh, B. And then you don't have to do this part, I just did it to prove to you what was going on. So I just kind of like threw them all together in a little data frame um, so that you could see how I was creating my two by two, two by two for every construction. Okay, this is nearly 4,000 different constructions. Okay, I don't know what happened to my overall here. Anyway, um, then we can pick an association measure that we like. So we could do PMI, we could do log likelihoods, we could do attraction, we could do faith, we could pick our favorite one. Um, what we're going to do here is use, I forgot already, Pin Fisher's uh, log PF, okay. uh, because that's the most normal thing with DCA, 
but if I wanted to do odds ratios instead, I could. So uh, it doesn't particularly matter here, but generally will people will pick one that is not directional. Okay. So last week we talked about conditional frequency measures that are conditionalized either by row or by column. You don't really want to do that in this particular instance because you're not, um, you're not interested so much in the marginal or the conditional probabilities. We're more interested in the, the sort of comparator probabilities. So uh, you will normally want to pick a non-directional one that includes C and D both. So the, margin, the conditional ones were A divided by A plus B and A divided by A plus C and you never use D. Uh, and we don't want to do that in this instance because D here now is only one of the groups. Okay. So what I'm going to do is calculate the expected value of A. This is the expected value of the British construction okay, given the entire table. Okay. So what should A be, knowing how frequent um, all the British constructions are and how frequent all the American constructions are, what should this combination be? So the way you calculate that, this is just like chi-square, which we're going to cover more later in the semester, but it's A plus B across divided by A plus C down, so row total by column total. Okay, so um, the probability of that construction and then the probability of British English divided by the entire sum. And so this A expected value is just the expected value of this British construction given the overall sum totals of American, and American constructions and British constructions. So I threw that in here and now I really want to compare these two columns. So uh, a batched is under, is over what we might expect, but abbreviated is over. Okay. Able is under, abnormal is over. Okay. So some, I don't know that they're ever like perfectly on the number, but they could be. Just depends on cell frequencies. Um, but this is like how much I might expect that value to be. Uh, and the way I always ex thought of expected values is Kind of like I think I I think I used this example in this class I can't remember but it's kind of like prior probabilities, right? So if I know that my friend is late to everything, then I don't freak out when they're late because I have a prior knowledge that they're late to everything. Right? If my friend is never late to anything, then if they're late to something, I'm a little nervous. Um, it's just like, a, oh, prior probability of, uh, there's always this joke about academics that they either respond to your email in five minutes or six years. Uh, <laughs> this is 100% accurate. Um, so the prior probability is either super fast or never, right? And essentially here, that's what we're calculating is given what we know about the table, what should this value be? I'm going to use this pd.fisher.colostruction argument. Right? This calculates Fisher's exact test. And one reason that you might want to pick this association measure over odds ratios or log likelihoods is that this one controls for small sample sizes. Okay. Now, obviously C and D here are not small, but A and B have lots of zeros and cells that are less than five. And so Fisher's exact test is a bit more accurate when you have cells in A and B especially that are small. And so that's one reason to, to like this test, to use this one more so than some of the other ones. All right, so calculate a P. We can convert those to log frequencies. So if A is less than expected, so look at this first row here, A is less than expected, then we're going to take the log 10, okay, which makes it a essentially a, um, A is less than expected. It should make it less, a negative, like I think here, three, what we're seeing, oh no, okay, it makes it positive. Um, 
So if A is less than expected, take the log 10 of it, else do the negative log 10. So let's just look at that. So if A is less than expected, let's take the log 10 of a p-value, and let's say that p-value is 0.01. Oops. Can't find that. Right. So that does make it negative. So if A is less than expected, make the value negative. If A is more than expected, make the value positive. I think maybe this is just being hard to read, but essentially here A is less than expected, but the p-value is basically, the log of the p-value is basically zero. Um, here A is more than expected. Do I have if else backwards in my head? Please hold. So this should be negative. This column should be negative. Let's just run this so that I don't misspeak right now. Let's hit this button, and then this button, and then let's make it all line up nice and easy. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> be that way. There we go. Okay. All right. So, oh, wait, where's my expected values? Oh, I'm running the wrong one. Okay, this is R, so it's command enter, too much Python. Why, why won't it line up next to each other? I'm just, I'm struggling today. Uh, I'm also running the wrong cell, I think, because I don't see the p-values at all. Shouldn't we see log pf here? I apparently did not run the stupid thing. Show them to me. Excellent. Okay. All right. So A is less than expected here. But what we see is that the p value. Make this a little smaller so I can see side by side which we saved as PVF. Well, let's not do a head, let's do a view. So we can see all of them. Ha ha, there we go. All right. So A is less than expected, but the P value is one. So we get a zero. Okay. Um, A is here, A is less than expected, but we're actually getting a positive number here. So I think I I'm explaining if else backwards. Um, if A is less than expected, the values are going to be positive. If A is more than expected, the values are going to be negative. Okay. Um, wait. You guys, are any of you like there? Because I am losing my mind. A is more than expected here, so the value is positive. <laughs> A is less than expected here, so the value is negative. Okay, so this is exactly how it sounds, except that I was think I was reversing these in my head. Okay. So A here is bigger than this number. Did you know that the 91 is bigger than 85? So the log PF comes out as positive. Okay. I've had my moment today. I'm done. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Host like Marine. Yeah. Okay, good. So as long as you guys are with me on that one. Um, and I'm realizing that your instructor has uh, had a long day. Uh, let's now interpret the finalized analysis because I was just misreading the column names. Um, I'm going to stick that log, um, log uh, Fisher's value into my data frame. I'm going to reverse order, so by doing the negative here, I'm just doing de descending order. I'm going to save the top British English words as 1 to 20. Uh, why 20? Just because, right, there's no particular reason why 20. If you could look at log p values over like 1.3 or something, I just look at, always look at the top 20, because that will tell you what's happening. And here are the top 20. Um, and so what we see, uh, this is important here, is that 
there are words that will have a much greater frequency in so this is the, the, the words that are attracted to British English, right? So they have the largest uh, ex frequency greater than expected. So quite happy, right, which is the maximizer, um, occurs more in British English than American English, so 1,700 to 500. But you can also see ones that don't necessarily um, follow that pattern where it's not like triple the amount. Okay. Like all of these are, but you'll see in a second that that's not true for the other end. So remember that this log value controls for frequency size. So it's not really a direct comparison of like, oh, this occurs 600 times more, uh, six times more. Okay. At the moment, it's just these are the most attracted words to British. Um, so said that. Now let's look at the negative numbers. Higher negative scores indicate that colexeme is attracted to American English. It's repulsed from British English. Okay. And here's what I was talking about. If you look at quite possible here, it is equally frequent, literally, in British and American English. But because of the data set size, where British English was twice as frequent as American English, you see that it's actually repulsed away from British English. It's more likely to occur in American English because the data set in British English is twice as large and it's occurring just as much in American English. Okay. So these numbers, these log values, account for the differences in corpora corpora size, um, which allows us to see that there's something different but impossible happening. And then here, quite different, it's actually more frequent in British English, but remember that the British English data set is twice as large. Okay. Um, so, and also sure. Uh, <clears throat> so that's to me what, what makes this work, is the fact that it actually controls for C and D. So I don't want to pick a conditional probability option that we talked about last time of just, um, just repulsion or just attraction because then it wouldn't look at all of the numbers. Here we're picking Fisher's exact test um, because it controls for the differences in size of each one. So let's look at them together. Uh, kind of cut off. We'll go and look at those in R in here a second. But in British English we're mostly seeing scalar adjectives, big, nice, difficult. Extreme adjectives, daunting, 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 staggering, and incredible. And a few limiting adjectives, right and prepared. Um, in American English, we're seeing a lot more limiting adjectives, certain, possible, different, aware. And um, some, a surprising thing that we're finding is that British English is more negative than American English. So let us look at the top 20 together. Um, and just kind of do this. Good grief. Guys, I know how to work our studio, I promise. Well, today. There we go. So here's, here's British English. Right? Happy, hard, extraordinary, big, relaxed, daunting. Um, these are mostly scalar, maximizing adjectives, staggering, worrying. Okay, so there's a little bit more negativity, difficult. Um, the top American ones, certain, possible, um, aware, right? effective, skeptical, tasty, willing, helpful, favorable, uh, sometime, which is kind of a weird phrase, quite some time. Um, but what we see is there are more limiting adjectives. So as quite possible, I'm quite certain, right? In um, British English, there are more maximizing, quite happy, quite extraordinary, quite relaxed. Um, and then surprisingly, in British English, you see a bit more negative words than you do in, in American English. Okay. That was an unexpected finding from this uh, data set. 
All right, so in summary, um, in summary, it is Wednesday, and thank you for your patience on me not being able to read column names. Um, but we can extend what we did last week to many, many colexemes. Okay. So we've picked a single lexeme, the word quite, and we've examined it across all of its possible colexemes, right, all the possible pairs, for British and American English. So we've scaled this up to quite a large analysis. And what we're seeing is if there are differences in the usage of these grammatical slots, where they're either maximizers or limiters, okay, um, based on cult culture. So we've pulled semanticity and culture and uh, slot, grammatical slots all in together into one analysis. And that really allows us to talk about the either structural differences in the language or cultural differences. This is definitely a cultural difference uh, than more of a structural difference. A structural difference would be more uses as of um, one week we talked about the burnt versus burned. That's more of a structure difference um, because it's a different verb form. Uh, cultural differences are the way we use the language. And this is really an applied chi-square analysis, because Fisher's exact test is a chi-square. And it takes this sort of qualitative frequency where we could have missed the fact that quite possible is very different across the two languages, and convert that into a quantitative number that's a bit more objective. Um, there's still the subjective interpretation of these top 20 words for each one. Um, but we've pulled it into more of an objective list, right? Uh, and that set really allows us to see how grammar and lexicon interact with each other. And so what we can extend this to is looking at um, differences in language shift. 